the alchemy of art, right? Like we, we create it and then we know that it lands on everybody differently, that, that we want each unique, you know, perspective and exchange to, to like inspire something different, you know, so I don't actually want everyone to get this message. I mean, it'd be wonderful if it increased people's acceptance and tolerance and, um, and open the possibility for them to try new ways of loving. I mean, that would be kind of at the, the uber, um, kind of the meta level, but the specifics of, you know, what is it from this book that uniquely touches and inspires each person? It's like, what are they ready to hear? What are they attracting in their life? And, and so it is really meta because it's not just about this book. It's about any art. Like, um, it would be propaganda if I was like, I want people to, um, to be more poly or this or that, you know, it'd be propaganda, not art. Like somebody could come away from this book and be like, okay, that's why I'm vanilla and monogamous. <laughs> but what a fun wild ride to read about that. And then to remember who I am and the truth of who I am is a committed individual who, you know, doesn't want to do that much work. Um, yeah, so I, I really don't have an agenda for what people get except for a reflection of what's possible. And the other thing is so important that, you know, this is so much, this is at like 52 like rituals. There's so much there that hopefully they get something and not all of it. And they go deep with that something. A lot of times we're like, ooh, I wanna try it all. And then we end up failing at everything as opposed to being like, wow, this really speaks to my soul and I'm going to take it deeper and I'm going to try this, not just try it once, twice, but like make it my own. Honesty is a deep soul value and um, I'm going to take your share and I'm going to apply it to the model that I just shared about myself, which is that... Um, when we have an unmet need, so like if it's the need for honesty, right? And it's like, they're not getting, it's not getting met. Oftentimes we believe we can't get that need met. We go into learned helplessness. And so whatever the need is, in this case, it's honesty for somebody else. It might be, um, I need kindness and I don't believe that I can be, get kindness from someone. So they end up attracting a lot of abusive people, like whatever that need is. When you don't believe, when you haven't gotten it, you don't, you don't know how to get it. You didn't get it as a kid. We put on this lens and the lens is like, all I see is dishonesty or my deep core beliefs tell me that people are being dishonest. And then we self-fulfilling prophecy attract people who are dishonest. And then we even sometimes when people are being honest, all we see is the d dishonesty. Like That's all we'll see is the thing that we're so afraid of not getting. Um, and then it'll put us into a position that's like, I don't even want to date anymore. Thank you. I'm normalizing this because it is how the human brain is wired to protect itself. It's like we have these pattern seeking mechanisms that are designed um, for, you know, for ego preservation and it gets a belief and it only sees that thing and it blocks... <laughs> the heart it blocks the innocence and the trust uh, that it takes to actually be to see a new person and be like this is a new person this is not all my past exes and lovers this is this new person this is a universal problem in relationships right now like we as a culture are in a poverty of time and even with the staycation of lockdown, um, we've now got, we're, we've got the competition of our attention seeking devices and, um, and the, you know, the, as I mentioned, the collective trauma and process that's coming up as a result of this kind of change. Um, and so, yeah, like making the time to get together and to be sexual has to be a priority. And it's, and it's this like, let's be creative instead of getting despondent. This, this
prioritization of being sensual and sexual often actually requires a slowing down, um, a lightening up, a doing less. And it's a deep inquiry of like, what is it that I'm doing that's not adding value to my life? And how can I cut that out of my life so that I can show up more resourced for lovemaking? Because like if lovemaking is a priority, it's not just lovemaking, it's actually being in the state that is helpful. And you know, these days, instead of devices being a competition for your attention, there's also things that can help online. Like there's Charles Muir has this beautiful meditation, like for couples to meditate and breathe and get into the state and then make love. Um, so there's things that you can do, you know, use those tools in the book. I have to say this is my little selfish, shameless self promotion. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, I used to write a chapter and then go self pleasure. And now I have people who are like, yeah, we read, a, read a chapter and then we pleasure each other. Um, but reading it together with your partner is a really fun way to, um, get creative and play. And it doesn't have to be read it and discuss. It's like, read it and you know, and play. I don't see poly as an easy path for anyone anyway. Um, you know, and looking at someone else's circumstances saying, oh, the grass is greener over there. It doesn't, it doesn't help. What helps is going, is like looking at, hey, what are my obstacles to love? Like polyamory is a spiritual path. And by spiritual path, I mean, it leads us to God. It leads us to more, you know, if God is love, it leads us to more love. And um, as Rumi teaches, writes in poetry that, you know, it's not our job to seek love, but to seek all the obstacles to it. Like love is our natural state and what are our obstacles to it. And so instead of saying, ooh, Polly's hard in these circumstances, like, ooh, what's coming up as my challenge to being in love with more people all the time? And love doesn't have to look like, you know, sex. Like we all know that it's like a rally cry around uh, polyamory is not about sex. It's actually about meeting in right relation. Like what is the true connection between each individual? And for some that's fully sexual and creative and wild. And for others, it's like intellectual. And for others, it's spiritual. And it's like, do you have permission in your life to meet each person and to have that soul exchange and part of that meeting, like this is the irony, right? Part of that meeting is meeting with the beloved's jealousy. So there are a lot of people who they're like, oh, polyamor is too hard because my, because this person is jealous or controlling or possessive. It's like, hey, that jealousy is the obstacle to love and it's a doorway to your liberation. So when your partner is being controlling and saying, I don't want you to see other people, it's not that they're not being poly, they're being with what is challenging them. And it's a cry for, hey, let's adjust this. This is this needs help. This needs attention. Their, their insecurity. And how do you love them in a way that they feel secure? And maybe they're not okay with you being with other people. Maybe they're not the right partner, but can you still love them as you separate and find your path? Um, so no, uh, polyamory is not easy. Love isn't easy. <laughs> um, and I don't have it that there's a particular set of circumstances that are, this makes it easier or this makes it, I will say that the more personal growth work that you and your partners do, uh, the more the pleasure to process ratio shifts in the pleasure, in the favor of pleasure the personal growth work as a foundation. And I would say, you know, the first two years, you're just learning the language. The first two years, anyone's starting poly has to be like really in this humble, like, you know, place of how, you know, confronting all your old programming, but it doesn't stop in two years. You know, I'm 20 years in and it's a steep path. It just keeps getting harder. I get challenged to my core as do my partners over unexpected you know, new things that we couldn't have foreseen, depending on who the new partner is. Um, so yeah, Whew, we definitely, I'm, I'm grateful that you brought that up. Um, you know, that we have a idea that this is the circumstance in which it would be easy. And it's 
rarely easy. <laughs> but we're not in it for the easy, right? We're in it for, uh, <laughs> for love and it's worth it. So this, this crossroads that we sometimes get to with our partners where it's like, okay, <laughs> I want ease and love and we're struggling together. And maybe there's more ease and love if we take space. Maybe there's ease and love if we lean into the struggle and break through. Like that crossroads, like it's so human. Um, it's a deep one and, and the answer is very unique to you your values and your situation. And then what's challenging is that same answer could be, let's lean in for one partner and let's lean out for the other partner. Like, how can that be? But it is, you know, so important that everybody finds like, what is your true north? And when, when you're talking about having, being married and having kids, it's not like an overnight decision. Like if it's a one night stand, you can make, you can, you know, flip a coin and make a call. <laughs> I'm being facetious. Um, but in the case of marriage, it's so, so, so important that you get outside perspective and help. You know, if you take nothing from today's live stream, like I want to encourage you to get that, the idea that we can work on our own relationships alone and solve our own love problems alone is, I think, a pathological obsession that is at the root of why, why we have so many unhealthy reflections of love in, in, in society. Now, I want to impart this idea that love is bigger than us. It's bigger than me. Love is bigger than me and one beloved and, and even, you know, the network of six lovers that I am currently connecting with. It's like love is bigger than all of us. And so anytime we say, I want to handle this, me and my partner alone, it, not saying that you're saying that, you're obviously openly speaking it out, asking for reflections, super valuable. And in the case of marriage, when you're like, hey, we're struggling, get help, get outside perspectives, because love can't be held by two people to a, you know, a small system. It has to have... Um, outside multiple reflections, love is much bigger than how we see ourselves. And too often when we're in partnership, it'll polarize and then there'll be struggle. Whereas if we just offer a holy third, then, you know, the possibilities really open up. So <clears throat> whether it's you getting help and perspectives on it, or the two of you, which is even better, or, you know, the, the threesome, foursome, triad, you know, the family system getting support. It's so important. Yeah. I really attribute most of my, um, you know, success in relational experimentation to the ongoing, um, mediation and outside perspective. And we do a thing called forum, which is where we get together and we, share reflections um, for each other. And that allows us to see beyond our own uh, stuck perspective. You've never had a threesome and you'd like to try it. <laughs> Why do you want to try it? I mean, I really want to know, like, what's your intention? So, um, <laughs> so your intention Gosh, I just got cut off from, welcome back to, um, <laughs> I got cut off when I was asking this juicy question, but here we go again. <sighs> Getting clear on why you want to have a threesome is um, a first step. What's your intention? And there's two other people involved, so you want to know what their intentions are because, um, aligning not just expectations but like really in the heart field knowing like what are we here for what are we co-creating um what actually gets co-created if done consciously if you enter into a threesome consciously you can intend you can um yeah you can alchemize together 
usually, and I'm going to contrast that with, hey, let's get drunk and fuck, like you can get inebriated and sloppy and just in the sensorial realm and, and having three-way connection can be, when you turn off the mind or, or, you know, the thinking, it can be really sensually rewarding, but that's just one dimension. Like you can also do it at the emotional level and the love level and the spiritual level like there's we have multiple bodies and so you want to know like if you're bringing all of yourself to that threesome like welcome all of who you're with and what is it that they're bringing and so i would genuinely start the threesome conversation with a an inquiry and a com and a exploration so communicating what it means and what is wanted. And I also, this is funny, but like, I would also suggest not just doing it once. Um, the first time, like the first time we do anything is usually, um, yeah, it's, it's like a, a rip in the record and you're trying something new. And as, as and although that can be a peak experience, it can also be a fumbly, awkward, disastrous experience. I would invite you to say, "Hey, let's let's do this a few times so that we can see what those dynamics are." And then at the end of it, be like, "Hey, how could we do this better?" Um, but starting with the conversation, and the conversation very specifically is, um, you know, what are your intentions? What are your boundaries? So you know that everybody has a bottom line and can communicate that, as well as you know, what are your desires and fantasies and hopes. And then um, from that place of what we all want to create, you might want to kind of address like, hey, let's try this position might meet all of our needs best. Or, you know, rarely it's like, let's just lay here and see how it goes. Like when people just want to let's just kiss and make out and see how it goes. It's like, that's that can lead to if there's a lot of chemistry and juice, but it can also be like, more fun when somebody who has an inspired idea makes a proposal and you try that and then everybody feels free to either um, decline or slow down. You know, I like saying, hey, let's use yellow and red as code words so that if anybody's uncomfortable, they can say yellow. We just breathe together. Um, but if anyone else has a different idea, like not to get stuck in the, okay, we're doing this. Um, it's more like, Hey, this would feel better. Or how would this feel? Or let's, you know, each, you know, propose. I mean, there's also kind of like training wheel threesomes that you could do where you set timers and kind of like say, okay, we're going to pleasure this person for the first 10 minutes and then this person, and then this person, you know, you can play with that and then see where it leads. And I'm a fan of structure. And I know that there's some people who are like, oh my God, when it comes to sexuality, like the arrows has to lead. And if there's any structure, I'm totally turned off. And so you want, that's why you want to communicate is like, are you sleeping with someone like me <laughs> who wants to know, Hey, what do we want to create? Or are you sleeping with someone that's like, I'm just falling into the mystery. And when you have three people, it's exponentially more complex, you know, than just one partner wrote the book, uh, which is filled with teachings, um, about not just polyamory, but kinky and queer and tantric lifestyle. And it's, you know, it's, it's my deep belief as an artist, and this is part of my artistic statement is that, you know, entertainment's great. It's, it's fun to be engaged and to be kind of erotically and by, by erotically, I mean like when your arrows, when all of your senses are engaged, it's like you're turned on, you're tapped in and that's gorgeous. But if that can also open you to the highest version of yourself or uh, raise your vibration to new possibilities or transmit, you know, a body of teachings, like that's where the art gets really juicy for me. You know, it's like I am an art activist and I want the art to actually awaken people. And so <laughs> this really raunchy story <laughs> which I'll give you a synopsis in a second, but the story is a parable for deeper teachings about love, about uh, healing and also awakening. And it kind of in this, in the order of like healing first and then like, you know, the 
the con connection and the passion and then beyond that it's um really like awakening a lot like in tantra the journey is you know to first do the the work i mean a spontaneous awakening can happen at any stage of development but sustainably if we work on the wounds and the cracks and the and the um resistance and the patterns and we break through that then we can get to pleasure and bliss and play which is wonderful and even we can be masterful with all the tools and techniques and practices um but beyond that uh it's you know the point of the practice you know is to get us in deeper communion love and blessings talk to you soon Thank you.